Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I, I just realized, listening to the previous presentations, and I, unfortunately I haven't been able to be here during the whole conference, so I realized I must be quite a strange bird, this guy. <laughs> so, this might be confusing because I'm, I'm trying to simplify also a very different kind of situation that we're dealing with. Um, was asked by, by Hans, the conference organizers, to, to try to relate this to JPI Urban Europe. Now, I'm in the management board of the JPI Urban Europe. I'm more responsible for strategic dialogues, and relationships, and well, research and innovation strategies that we do. And basically, what we do, we are JPI, it's a joint programming initiative, which means that we collect around the societal challenge, in this case, urban <coughs> uh, member states and their well funding agencies is the main point but also other kinds of active stakeholders to join up and see what we can do so it's kind of similar to aeronets you may have heard of the, the previous kinds of aeronets in the European situation although we are not actually under the European Union there are member states initiative so we partner up with the union many times. Uh, we are trying to fulfill objectives of the European research area, but we are quite, let's say we have a, an integrity. Um, of course, it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, in our strategic research and innovation agenda, which we usually sum up something like this, Pointed, yes. Um, we're trying to shape capacities, help cities, urban areas, different kinds of actors to move on, accelerate urban transitions towards sustainable and livable cities well, and urban areas. I keep on saying it. It doesn't sound very good in English all the time, but cities is. Uh, reduction sometimes to a city to territory and that's not really how the urban or well, the planetary urban situation is like so bear with me with that kind of thing. Um, we are trying to do this by uh, setting up more of a longer term urban transitions program urban research and innovation program however we know that this will be iterative in some kind, <coughs> trying to find ways to support cities and urban areas. Uh, and we're currently looking into how to actually do this, because we know that urban sustainability is also quite fragmented landscape. We heard this in a previous presentation on just on different data, but if you look at different data, and information modeling approaches to urban settings. You can also look at different other kinds of conceptual approaches and you see that there is a, let's say it's not always a good communication between different approaches, which means we have a relatively fragmented landscape, which is okay in one sense. It's just, it's becoming difficult if you want to invest and fund uh, in this because you, may risk shaping many wicked issues in terms of solutions that comes out of it, right? So we're trying to set this up uh, to, to collect this and, and make something sensible out of this, connect dots but not shaping one big model. Uh, on the way we're also doing thematic <coughs> priority uh, calls, sometimes joint, big joint calls in Europe, now we are having one open and actually closes today with the Belmont Forum on food, what energy nexus. Um, we are also looking into how to program calls in, in different ways in the future. I won't get in too much to that. I will probably get to know. If you are interested in calls, uh, you can look at our agenda. It's downloadable. Uh, there has been some changes, so there will be a kind of an update in our newsletters later on. The one thing that we really can't do, and this is a tricky issue with a green spiral thing that we use to visualize how we want to get on with things, is that many times in policy, you're talking about it in this way. You put in some research funding, 
which should, at the end, kind of shape some societal benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a sausage factory version of how mm -hmm. knowledge production, knowledge integration, uh, and so on, how it works, right? Um, it's easy. It's easy to position yourself, perhaps, along this line. But that's really how it actually works. And again, looking at the presentations before me, there are some quite tricky issues if you have this at the back of your mind and trying to actually interact with an urban planning office. <laughs> it's not that there is a clear societal benefit at the end as an end product that kind of impact. There's something else that is happening all along, right? So we're not actually that much into <coughs> funding this kind of approach. Um, we're looking more into urban innovation ecosystems and this has become kind of a slightly hyped notion, innovation ecosystems. But the basic line is uh, if the linear model kind of looks at it in this very simplified way, you have one side that brings knowledge and the other side is kind of the demand side uh, and they are not, it's non-knowledge. But that doesn't really seem to resonate well with, again, if you are approaching urban planners, they have lots of knowledge, right? Lots of passive knowledge, different kinds of technical knowledges that you need to learn in order to be able to provide them with a sensible, uh, the, the knowledge product, the, the kind of input that you want to give, right? So taking this into account, uh, urban situations around knowledge, but also around economics and so forth, <coughs> tends to look more like this, right? Many different kinds of knowledges. It's not that kind of straight line anymore. So for us, we see that it's important to have in cities and urban areas that we can support this more creative and you know, way because that also, we bet, is a way to support transitions. Right? Many small innovations, things are happening and suddenly you have a transition hopefully towards more sustainable lifestyles. And that's the tricky part, of course. Uh, but we're also looking at this from a European point of view, since we're a member states initiative, and we're supposed to align, in a way, different national programs on urban research and innovation. So we're also setting up a kind of a knowledge infrastructure, supporting that, and how you can shape communications, help communications, in a European setting, as well as an international setting, as far as possible. But international, that means mm -hmm. outside Europe, sorry for the technical lingo. Um, so the more transnational system that we're working with is, of course, joint calls. That's something we do as a kind of core business. However, let's see what the animations here are. Oh, sorry. There. Um, we're also this might be interesting for you to connect to the uh, we're setting up a kind of capacity building also in, in research uh, organizations. It's the Urban Europe Research Alliance. Uh, they're working with providing us with influence from a, let's say an institutional point of view. Uh, we also have activities on aligning national programs but also research infrastructure and so forth. We are also very much into discussing and shaping, supporting living labs, urban observatories and databases, those kinds of approaches to development. That also means that we are quite involved in the European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities and Communities. Uh, we are also looking at, again picking up from the former previous presentations, we are actually trying to set up guidelines uh, and have to shape dialogue there on, on integrated planning measure uh, as a way of connecting the dots. But uh, in the smart city community, that is a big issue at the moment. Also, business models and, and kind of exploitation issues, of course. But that is what we're doing. So the kind of non-linear involvement that we're looking for is more like this. We develop common vision, and this is perhaps probably nothing strange actually. It's just that it's important to keep on doing it because there seems to be a kind of a um, backbone, what's it called, uh, the reflex 
retort back into more linear models uh, when things are actually implemented in policy. It's very strange. So you need to keep these kinds of dialogues, the interaction and the integration, uh, n almost holistic approach. But I prefer not to use holistic because as a geographer, I think, well, maps in the scale one to one isn't that useful. <laughs> so, but it's simplifications and integration of, of key actors, perhaps key elements. Sorry for the. <laughs> uh, of course, and this is a nice simplification model. Usually, it's a lot more messy in practice, of course. Uh, our agenda, the strategic research and innovation agenda that we published in 2015 was actually done in this way. It took a long time for us to do it. Everybody was kind of waiting because all the other JPIs had them quite early on. But for us it was very important to do it in this way, look at different communities of practice and what they actually needed and see that as far as possible we kind of we would resonate with them. And if you read the agenda, you will also notice that there are many different voices in the style of the text. And that's almost intentional nowadays to show that. Now we are working with, we call the Agora a Stakeholder Involvement Platform, that will keep on having this kind of dialogue in order to uh, shape our activities, shape input, shape uh, sensible ways of moving forward in how to actually support urban transitions. So, now to the thing I was asked to do. <laughs> that was a brief uh, introduction. Um, I, I couldn't think of any... I had to prepare this a bit in advance, but I couldn't prepare it because I had to listen to your presentations uh, to give some kind of an idea. And I, first of all, of course, subsurface specialists so it's, it's very interesting for me personally, but also I think for the community on, on urban research and innovation, the kind of communities that are into tackling societal challenges, climate, adaptation, mitigation, and so forth, but also for the cultural heritage angle. So you have different angles in urban governance, for example, uh, which is sometimes called the more natural issues that are mixed up with the so-called more socio-economic issues and all of this seems to be that you have a kind of a you have a way of actually approaching that in, in many different ways um, let's see, I, I was trying to make some notes and I'm going to use them yeah. oh. so one thing would perhaps be for me, I mean, I, I think we fully support and I think that Urban Europe could probably help and support in, in, uh, support you in your endeavor to, to shape integrated approaches, yeah? be a part of that, also a bigger movement in urban planning and development. We have seen that in different <coughs> kinds of projects and, and, and actions that that's usually where you end up. We're still not that very integrated in urban planning and management all the time. Um, it has something to do with the fragmentation of different disciplines, different fields of research, but also, of course, policy sectors, policy silos. So that sometimes helps, it creates, it may risk to create wicked issues in, in terms of actions in urban areas and the planners know this very, very well. Uh, so how do we actually integrate then different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of practices in this and, and, and shape good ways of looking at cities. So in that, from that point of view, as we can support that, we would also kind of put the question back a bit and say, so, so how do you think of yourselves uh, or, or this area, subsurface so specialism, uh, in urban innovation ecosystems? Um, I could try to give you one answer, but that would also be perhaps to, to, to take you somewhere. Um, maybe if we are to have sound, kind of vivid and bustling urban 
life, urban innovation ecosystems. They may not be an end in themselves, but they probably have shaped urban transitions. But for them to be able to work, you also need some urban infrastructures, right? Different kinds of infrastructures. So I, I see clearly looking at how you're approaching the whole complex matter of, uh, well, the anthropogenic subsurface layer, for example, sometimes, and you may not agree with this as old, but I, I would connect this directly to the kind of the Anthropocene thing, thinking about how we actually deal with matter, urban matters. Right? So that could be one way of putting it, that you, you need to have that kind of infrastructural approach in order for other things also to be working well. Um, I think there might also be a role for you. I, I don't want to reduce you into specific roles, but looking at this, there might also be a role as a, in a way, it's a spectacular thing, because I don't think many people looking at urban issues today, urban development as a societal challenge, look at, uh, uh, usually, of course, you probably very well aware of this, that, that, that they don't really think about the subsurface things. So, as a reminder, hey, look, you, you keep forgetting half the city. Uh, that could be a, a good role also to help other blind spot areas, if you wish, uh, to be brought up in the kind of big integration uh, movement. But that's, that's a long shot for me, but maybe that could be a way. So um, with that, I say, if you have any questions, uh, please. Maybe you have more answers in how you see your role in, uh, let's say, how we strive to tackle the urban societal challenges at the moment and well, shape transitions. Thank you. How do you see the approach being taken in Europe compared to where perhaps the most spectacular urban development has been taking place in recent decades in China? In China, for example, the subsurface is a key element of their urban development planning to the extent that they have developed models of 20 largest cities with subsurface in China and are using it as an active component in their development planning. Hmm. Uh, actually, I didn't know that. So, of course, that's, that's an interesting way of, of comparing, right? Because, if I put it this way, for JPI Urban Europe and for, well, the Commission and the Horizon 2020 approaches, of course, shaping collaboration with China is a big thing. Right? It's very difficult at times, but it's also something that is clearly needed if we're going to, well, tackle planetary urbanism for that. So it's an interesting example to just to see the differences. I, I, I'm, since I'm not even sure how far European cities and urban areas are in actually looking at the subsurface thing, just looking at it from a fun functional regional point of view, for example. I'm not sure how far different areas are. I, I just suspect there are huge differences. <coughs> but then comparing Europe to China, <coughs> it might be a good way of bringing this forward because I think in, in the near future we will see more calls on collaboration, joint uh, well, consortia building between China and Europe in urban development. So it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see you talking about how you're funding the methodology because as somebody that works for a council it can be incredibly frustrating to have researchers come to you and say we need you in your project but all they're really after is their Tadal moment or their, their PhD or the number of students and they don't realise that a lot of the stuff they produce is too technical, they get hung up on referencing it and making sure that another academic can read it and don't act, it all gets lost in translation and as a result the practitioners don't actually use it. A, you can't find it because the first thing you do is Google. 
So if you can't find it on Google, it ain't worth writing. Um, the second bit is written in language, and I am kind of narrowing this down to kind of, I'm not going, but it is that kind of thing that kind of a lot of the resources we have in councils are very limited at the minute, and they're shrinking. So you need to expect things fast. And you need to be able to, so one of the good things about this is being the talking, actually having that little bit of space to talk between planners and geotechnical engineers and have that little bit of space to try to explain what we mean. And I think some of the good, you know, we say planning, but it means a heck of a lot of different things to a whole lot of different people. And even across Europe, there's different ways of being planned. So I did the degree in planning, but other people have done architecture first and then planning as an adult or it's their specialist. So people are coming at it from different angles as well. So it's it's useful to see that kind of way of doing it because I think that's a good way forward to get people talking in the same space. Because the silo kind of one is not really the silo is dirty and it's done and you'll drown in it if you want to think about the silo properly. Whereas that's giving a bit of oh it's so great because you feel comfortable in it and if you read it. So, well. thanks for the comment. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my previous job was actually training urban and regional planners at Stockholm University. So, uh, not being a planner myself, but as a human geographer, we're kind of hosting that program. So, dealing with these kinds of knowledge integration issues, different epistemological communities, those kinds of issues are huge importance just to prepare students for work life. I, I describe it as Jack of all trades and master of none. So I'm yeah. not a specialist in anything apart from gaining knowledge so in a spatial environment. I mean, this, this is very conceptual and schematic, for example, but, but we realize that in, in lots of the projects that uh, build in our situation, and I guess I also see that uh, we have maybe, I've seen, some have seen in Horizon 2020 bids, it's quite easy to see when, let's say, of course, research, academic research are usually the best ones to write applications because that's many times they're very well trained to do it. It's the job. They, they are very used to write huge chunks of text. Right? Not all different stakeholders are that used to work with text in that way. So that's one thing. Researchers are very, very useful for that. On the other hand, it's, it's clear when the call calls for, let's say, a genuine co-creation of a research question and research design and you see that well non-academic stakeholders are there with just a letter of intent but probably not even into the thing from the beginning and that's very difficult I know because time and resources for other kinds of stakeholders to actually take part in it it's, it's it takes time it's difficult to do this so we're not saying that it's easy but rather saying that we probably need a lot more of it than we need to train ourselves a lot more in doing this. So we're pushing that. Um, but that's one thing. But the other thing that we touched upon a bit is also what this very easy conceptual way of thinking about how we can have a dialogue and shape something sensible, it doesn't talk about the very different ways of timing. I mean, there's a very different timing in the academic, in, I mean, strawman version of academics, they live in a very different time, uh, orbits around things. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's like in the solar system, it's a very different timing from what the policy does. It's a very different adrenaline in policy, right? Uh, yeah, we need it tomorrow. Oh, yeah, but I need to write this out in a year. Perhaps I can write out my, my field notes next week. Those kinds of issues, right? So that's also one thing. And of course, businesses and industry also have a very different time compared to policy, academics, and civil society. Who knows what kinds of timings there are? Um, so, so that's also kind of an issue in this that we don't really see, but worth keep in mind in how you actually try to integrate that. You know, it's not always that the it's like this strange 1960s mobiles, <laughs> modern art. There were a couple more things. Okay, I, I oh, yeah, very the, quickly in my next the, the sense of planning. I'm not sure because since we have a couple of urban planners in the room, I'm, I'm very curious about this. I mean, for me, sometimes, even in kind of more 
high profile situations, policy situations, it seems like people still understand planning as well. You have a plan, and it's a spatial plan, 2D, and that's it. And then you just try to follow the plan, and that's implementation. And, and for me, no, but that's not, well, it's part of that. There is a movement to yeah. think outside the red line boundary, so I'm a planner in Scotland, there's a review of plan management in Scotland, and it stands to say you need to look holistically, you need to make sure you get the strategic stuff right, and that there are different scales of plan, yeah. and there are different ways of planning, and different tools to do the different things. <coughs> you can get very sucked in if all your focus on development is what's within the red line of something, and forget that it has an impact on that red line. Exactly. Um, yeah, look, Kind of part of that is all that planning is not. We well, probably sense that it's rarely that things actually go according to plan, right? So planning is more of an activity to deal with things on the move, rather than just setting up the plan. And that seems sometimes very difficult to understand in how how you understand urban planning. That right? it's an ongoing activity. It's project management in a very different way than just having a plan. And this is very simplified, but I, I think that's also worth keeping in mind when we approach uh, public administration. Um, anyway, sorry, the vision has to be defined. Yes. But, I mean, even if you have a definition, things move, there are moving targets, and especially in complex situations, there are many kind of moving target things, right? So, a plan is really just that kind of stipulated definition. Plan is also how you're actually going to work with to meet the challenges that arise along the way. And it's a very different sense than the kind of <coughs> late 20th century planner that had, I have a plan. Now let's build this. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, you mentioned that planning and, and uh, making guidelines and maybe kind of standardized planning or something you you are uh, uh, JPI is something you're looking into as funding, or was I misunderstanding you? Maybe not standardized planning in that sense, but rather capacity building. Yeah, so that is an area that uh, JPI is actually funding and making calls on at the time, because we need something next, and we have built a really good foundation here to make a next step. So you would say that you have calls uh, of funding that could fit in for parts of uh, our network? I would say yes, probably. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can probably see some of this in, in, in Horizon calls as well, but our, our approach is very much, it's, it's not that the calls are specified in that way, but it's kind of like a red thread in, in many of our calls. They have different thematic uh, gravities Right. There's, there's an upcoming probably on urban accessibility, which is probably around urban mobility issues more. Still, in that, we're probably also looking at, so how do we support, for example, public sector capacities to deal with all this innovation, all the <coughs> research, knowledge, production that's going on, but also in industry and in civil society, there's lots of stuff going on that if our public planning sector administrations, if they're not kind of able to deal with this, then uh, we probably won't see much of transitions either. Because so I, I believe that we are quite unique. We are the specialists, um, <coughs> some academia, some, uh, some surveys, and we do have uh, uh, city partners who are trying to apply and, and improve our, our delivery of knowledge. Uh, so compared to other networks, we, we do have the partners that are needed to succeed, I think. Yes. But, and I would say also, I mean, we, we have a, our calls, of course, are a bit tricky sometimes because you need to, to match the funding agencies, the countries that are taking mm -hmm. part in the call with your kind of um, consortium players. Uh, but also, and I'm sorry, not really up to date, but, but looking at that kind of approach, I think 
data cultural heritage. Of course, we'll begin with the King Hans presentation. But I mean, data is water. They should also have something that kind of provides this set of the kind of societal challenge of urban water issues that. Of course, we are also interested in that, but we overlap some so data water can take perhaps more of the specialist community in this sense sometimes. So I think they should also have cause upcoming or activities that could also I mean could be a good collaboration with this cost activity or a future cost activity. Um, I have a comment. Uh, I just want to attended a conference in Brisbane, Australia last autumn. Uh, it was a waterworks conference, and they uh, uh, were very focused on uh, fulfilling the, the sustainable development goals and, and wanted to go into that. How about the cities and the sustainable development goals? Um, As a business, uh, they, they say, I'm sure full, full into that. Don't you think that there could be an option for, for cities to, or a demand for the cities to, to go into that and that would be close to, if they had to do that, then uh, there would be a need for more specific uh, tasks to, to fulfill? Exactly. As, as kind of one element of the more the transition program, transitions pathway program is also targets and data and monitoring issues and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals are very much into, I mean mainly at home, they're very into shaping in indicators. How do we actually build indicators around it? So for example, the Habitat and the New Urban Agenda, that, that's a very different kind of activity, more policy oriented. But the SDGs, as we see it, it's a lot about shaping indicators. So. Uh, we are supporting it. We were anticipating this when we wrote our agenda. So that's also a way of, of saying, well, for example, I think the, the urban sustainable development goal is number 11. But of course, there are other goals that also kind of affect and, and, and relate to urban development in different ways. But any kind of support in how to develop these indicators I think that as a baseline, that's a very good approach at the moment. Because uh, that's, everybody is looking at the SDGs in a way. Uh, I think some cities are, but a lot in policy making is looking at it. But I think few actually are on to how to actually deal with the complex set of indicators that you actually need. And the, again, the issues between different indicators and goals in this context. So yes. I think the time has um, expanded a 